Okay, today's lesson is going to be a conclusion to semi-conservative replication, and we're going to start RNA. All right, what is DNA replication called? Oh boy. Go ahead, Sage. No? Ryan? No? Duncan? Semi-conservative replication is what DNA replication is called. It's because you keep a template strand to produce a new strand. You save half to make the other half. What do you call the original strand of DNA? Raise your hands. Yeah, it, you can call the template. What would be another name for it? Yeah. The parent strand. And what do you create by reading the template? Jasmine? Uh, the daughter strand is the product of half the parent and then half the new. But when you're reading a template, what do you are what are you producing when you make the other half of the template? Say Shane? The complement. And that can lead to the daughter strand. What direction do you read DNA from? From what to what? Andrew? Three, to five. three prime to five prime. Okay. Uh, what enzyme opens up the DNA to expose the nucleotides? DNA helicase. Okay, what enzyme, or no, it's actually not an enzyme. Um, what proteins are gonna keep the DNA apart so that it won't rebond after you've separated it? Riley? Single strand binding protein. All right, what do you, not just in molecular genetics, but in everything in life, what is that starting point in which you begin a project or you begin a process? What do you call that initial starter? Ayla? Hold on, answer that first. What do you call the starting point of a project or a process where you begin? No? Primer. The primer. What is your question? Of what? What, it, which one, what part of it is the single strand? We didn't write the single strand binding protein. It's on the video that, that I showed you. It's not an enzyme. It's just kind of like it's proteins that are just holding the two sides of the bubble apart. Hold on. Um. What enzyme lays down the primer? RNA primase. Let's see. What enzyme is going to begin at the primer and then read all the template strains and base or bases and based on what the template says is going to produce the complementary nucleotides? DNA polymerase three. 
What enzyme is going to replace that temporary primer with a permanent DNA sequence? DNA polymerase one. DNA polymerase one. Okay, uh, now, let's say that I have a replication fork here. This is the replication fork where I have that arrow pointing. This is five prime, that's three prime. This is three prime. Down here is five prime. Which strand is the leading strand? And how do you know? Andrew? Towards what structure? Okay, the top strand would be the leading strand because it goes from three to five towards the replication fork. That is correct. So this is the leading strand. The leading strand is defined as the strand that is being replicated towards the fork, so it is continuous. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of show you guys what happens here. The, rep, the leading strand is easy. First off, RNA primase lays down a temporary primer. And once that primer has been established, DNA polymerase 3 is going to produce complementary nucleotides based on the nitrogenous bases that are already present on the template strand. It is continuous. So as helicase continues to unzip and expose more and more and more nucleotides, the leading strand is going to continue to be assembled towards the fork. But now the lagging strand is the one that's trickier. Did we get cut off on this one late yesterday? Okay, so I can try to explain it very simply, and I'm going to show you guys a video that will hopefully put it all into motion for you. So pay attention to this. RNA, or first off, the lagging strand is replicated away from the fork. So watch this. Let's say that RNA primase lays down a temporary primer right there. And again, it's going away from the fork. So DNA polymerase 3 is going to jump onto that primer and go away from the fork. So it's going to create nucleotides up to a point. And then it's going to stop. Now, RNA primase is going to go back here and establish another one. Hartley, you paying attention? Uh, this stuff's very elaborate. Hearing me is a quarter of the battle. RNA primase is going to be right there. And then DNA polymerase 3 is going to make more nu uh, nucleotides up to a point, up to where the previous primer was. But I want you guys to notice this right here. You see that gap? That's a problem. I didn't, that's not just a typo by me. That's what appears. That's a little gap between those two fragments. Now, do we go over yesterday what these fragments are on the lagging strand? They're discovered by a Japanese scientist. Jet? You're close. Jasmine? Okazaki fragments. Those are called Okazaki fragments. They're, the replication of the lagging strand is discontinuous, which means it starts and stops and starts and stops and starts and stops. Now, watch this. DNA polymerase 1 is going to come in here erase that RNA primer and create a permanent DNA sequence. And then ligase, DNA ligase is going to seal that fragment. And then polymerase one will come back here and replace that um, primer with a temporary sequence or with a permanent sequence. So the laggy strand is a little more sophisticated. Um, but to put this all into motion for you, and let's go over some of the new stuff. Sophia, can you turn on that light again? Thank you. Okay, so let's continue where we left off. Um, Okazaki fragments.
these are sections of complementary nucleotides. on the lagging strand and it's only on the lagging strand because the lagging strand is discontinuous and then lastly where we should have ended yesterday is the enzyme dna ligase <clears throat> it connects okazaki fragments yes They are. They're sections of complementary nucleotides. Those, however you want to phrase it, it can be phrased different ways. An Okazaki fragment are going to be sections of sequences of nucleotides, like a certain amount on the lagging strand. And ligase is just going to connect them as more and more are created. If I go back to this video again, Jasmine, if you watch this, There, that is an Okazaki fragment that was just made. And then ligase is going to come and connect them. And then another round of DNA replication is going to be conducted. Start off with RNA primase, then DNA polymerase 3, then DNA polymerase 1, and then ligase. You still have a question about all that? All right. So ligase, uh, it seals the gaps. Next is going to be topo isomerase. Topo isomerase is an enzyme that basically allows the DNA to, or it prevents the DNA from twisting while it's being replicated. It prevents DNA from twisting into its 3D helical shape while it's being replicated. Is this on the lagging chain too? It's on both. All right, there's one more enzyme I need to go over with you guys, and it is a process called nucleotide excision repair. There will be typos in the DNA. It is an accident. Nature makes mistakes. I mean, look at the chihuahua. It's actually not nature, that's that's man. Yeah, that's mankind doing that. I know, it's, have you ever seen the skull of a pug before? It is ridiculous. Chihuahua looks like a cantaloupe with a little snout. Well, there are mistakes that happen. For instance, let's say here's a strand of DNA and we got A, T, G, G, C, T. So that's the template strand. The complement should read T-A-C-C-G-A. But what if it says this instead? Whoops, we have a problem here. Those, nit or those nitrogenous bases are incorrect. So what we have to do is we have to use an enzyme called a nuclease. Nuclease is basically like scissors. It is an enzyme 
that removes errors. Now that's, you can call, you can think of it like scissors, you can think of it like whiteout, whatever. So I'm gonna play the role of, whoop. Nuclease, there it is, gone. And then what enzyme is gonna fix it? DNA polymerase three um, makes the repair. And so the repair is gonna happen. You'll get your adenine, you'll get your cytosine and everything is gonna be fine. Is this process 100% effective? Absolutely not. If it were, there would be no mutations, there would be no mistakes, there'd be no cancer, there'd be no problems at all. That obviously is not the case when it comes to DNA. We all look different. The reason why Jet's head is a different shape than Shane's head, mutation. The reason why Hartley is blonde and Duncan is brunette, mutation. I have blue eyes, some of you have brown eyes, mutation. So some mutations actually do miss. They don't get caught and they are allowed to proceed and exist. So this process is not 100% effective. All right, that's about it for semi-conservative replication. So now let's get into the next topic, which we'll begin today and it'll carry over into tomorrow. And that is being called the genetic code of life. So, uh, let's see, Amy, Mini, Miney, Hartley. Hartley, you have blonde hair. Is that your real hair? <coughs> you get highlights, but are you a natural blonde? Okay, uh, all I heard is blonde. Great. Now, Hartley, here's my question. You are a mutant. All humans derive from Africa. And as you guys know, with African characteristics is dark hair, dark eyes, dark skin. Well, we're all humans. She really doesn't have many dark features at all. So somewhere in her ancestry, a lot of mutations happen over time. My question is, how did the mutation in her DNA, the A's, the T's, the C's, the G's, how are they actually expressed to where we can see them? How did they get from the mutation in her cells to actually be expressed by her body? Ryan? I'm sorry? Yeah, they're in her DNA, but I'm asking you, how do they get out? How do they get expressed like this? Okay, you're on the right track. Go ahead. Mitosis. Mitosis, yes. When you're going through mitosis, is that when the, um, the mutations are occurring? The mutations could already be in the from your sperm from your parents' sperm and egg. Okay. So like the mutations that occur in meiosis. It could be before meiosis. It could be part of your parents' genetics. My dad was born without wisdom teeth, and so am I. So apparently he got it from his parents. Mm -hmm. You may have your own set of mutations. Or maybe you have more of your grandparents. You have to look at a whole family. Okay, so Ryan, you're actually on the right track with messenger RNA. That's um, the point is, guys, when you have a thought in your head, and let's say that you are reading something online and you want to comment on it, that thought in your head, you're actually able to write on the on the app that process that you're doing is actually called transcription in the basic english language let me actually read it for you the definition of transcription and it's a word you've hopefully heard of before when it comes to genetics 
Transcription is defined as a written or printed representation of something. Does anybody know what that person is in a courtroom whose job is just type everything that is said by the judge, the, the attorneys, the witnesses, the defendants, the plaintiffs? What's that person called? They type went really fast. Do you know what they're called? That's what they do, but it's a very complicated word. Isn't it? Four, four syllables. Hannah? Yeah, very good. Stenographer. Their job is to be like, do, 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 do all this stuff. And then the judge says, strike that, strike what the attorney said from the record, because the attorneys might say, Your Honor, we wish that the previous statement be stricken from the record. And the judge may comply and says, strike it. So the stenographer just has to hit delete and delete that last um, comment. So the point I'm making here is somewhere in Hartley's cells, there's a mutation. That mutation is in her cells. So here's a cell, here's a nucleus, here's her DNA. But right here is a mutation. That mutation says blonde. How does that get out? That's my question. How does that mutation get out of her cell? Well, Ryan said is actually pretty on point. He says messenger RNA. So RNA is made from DNA, and then proteins are made from the RNA. So I have an analogy for you all. I hope this analogy makes sense. Earlier classes said they, they kind of get it. And it's really how DNA and RNA and proteins are actually all together and they're all part of the same story. Duncan, you ready for this story? Great, glad you're awake, Duncan. So, Dan is playing the video game Mortal Kombat. Finish him, fatality. It's a fighting game on a lot of game consoles, Xbox, Nintendo, PlayStation, and so on. Dan needs a code to play as a very special character who's super deadly. The character's name is Ryan. And the only place that you can get the code is from Barnes & Noble. So Barnes & Noble is going to play the role of something in my little analogy. Barnes & Noble Bookstore is going to play the role of the nucleus. It is a place where the actual cheat book, here it is. This is the Mortal Kombat cheat book. Here, let's, let's make it official. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> there we go. Mortal Kombat with a K. And so... Dan's going to go over to Barnes & Noble, the nucleus, and he wants to find this. But here's the problem. This manual cannot leave the bookstore. It's too valuable. It's too big. It's one of a kind. Can't leave. So what he's going to do is he's just going to visit, and he's going to find the small little cheat code inside. So in this analogy here, the, the manual is going to play the role of DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. In this manual, you have everything you need for every Mortal Kombat game ever made. He doesn't need all that. He doesn't need to know about Mortal Kombat 1 or 3 or 4, Trilogy and all that stuff. He wants the code for Mortal Kombat 11 to play as Ryan. Killer character. So, that one little cheat code, not the whole page, not the whole book, not the whole paragraph, just the cheat code, that, that is going to be a gene sequence. But here's the catch. Here's Dan's dilemma. This can't leave. Dan, how can you get a code from this book back to your house if the book can't leave the store? You make the bookstore your house. You can't live in the bookstore. You're, all, you're a tourist. No, you can only visit. Take a picture. That's a good idea. You have no phone. Um, write it down. Write it down. Write it down. Okay. We're getting somewhere. Dan had brought himself a pen and a sticky note. He has a sticky note to copy. What's the another word for copy? Transcribe. 
He brought a sticky note. That sticky note is going to serve as messenger RNA or mRNA. And he is going to copy the code for the cheat onto his sticky note. And he's going to put the book back. He's done with it. He got it. He didn't need the whole thing. He just needed the code. And so that process of Dan actually copying the code from the manual to the note is a process called transcription. Transcription is just a fancy pants way of saying copy. Read the transcript, read the transcript. Now, Dan has his uh, code, he has his sticky note, he's gonna leave the nucleus, and he's gonna go back home. And then he's gonna actually type, turn on his video game, he's gonna enter the code, and voila, he can play his rhyme. So, the actual process of entering the code from the sticky note to the game is known as translation. And now, the actual special character, Killer Ryan, that's the protein. In biology, proteins actually do things or they build things. Speaking of Hartley's hair, Hartley's hair, just like all of us, is filled with keratin. It makes up your hair, fingernails, and it's on the surface of your skin. It, it's a protein. It comes from the codes written in your DNA. Your collagen elastin, you guys are teenagers. You're able to, your skin is very stretchy. It's not all saggy. You pull back, your arm goes right back up. Unlike grandma, where it's all saggy. That's collagen and elastin. Those are proteins. They come from your DNA. So our, the biggest misint misinterpretation that I've seen is when students hear of DNA here's, and RNA, here's what they think. They think, oh, DNA looks like this. It's double helixed. RNA is single helixed. That's what they think. Let me tell you the small uh, <coughs> fundamental error in that thinking. Size is a big um, factor in here. Imagine that this is someone's entire DNA, like all of it, their entire genome. If you wanted to make an RNA transcript, here's what you're going to do. You're just going to copy that little bit right there, just that. And based on that little sequence right there, you're going to make yourself an RNA complement. That is messenger RNA. It's just a little sample. It's a little sample of the entire code. A couple weeks ago when I cut my thumb, I did not need to get the instructions in my genetic code to make bone or organs or to go through puberty again. I just needed the information to make new skin cells. That's it. You don't need all that information, just a little blurb. So we're going to spend the rest of our time talking about D or RNA and just basically what it is. Does anybody know what RNA stands for? Right? Ribonucleic acid. RNA, what type of macromolecule is it? Unit one question, unit one question. Yeah, I mean, it's, hey guys, Psst, check it out. It's actually in the main. It's a nucleic acid.
Is it a polymer or is it a monomer? It's a polymer. So what are the monomers that make up RNA? Nucleotides. Now on Tuesday, we went over the parts of the nucleotide and we did this back in unit one in September. So this is the third time in this class we're doing this. What are the three parts of a nucleotide in any given order? Tell me one, Ryan. A pentose sugar is one of them. The reason it is called a pentose sugar because it has five carbons. What is the name of the pentose sugar in RNA? Hannah, ribose is correct. What is another component? Phosphate group. Remember that phosphate is PO4 with a negative three charge. And what is the third and final component? I'm glad you saved this for last. Okay. Nitrogenous base. How many bases does <coughs> RNA have? DNA had four. How many does RNA have? Jasmine has four as well. Trick question. Well, there's two different types of nitrogenous bases, two different classes, if you will. Do you recall what those are called? Riley? Purines and pyrimidines. Which one is the big molecule? Double ring, right? Purine looks like this. And that means pyrimidine is a single ring. Which nitrogenous bases in RNA are purines? There's two of them. Their name kind of rhymes with purine, if you really try. Dan? Adenine and guanine. Adenine and guanine. I'm loving the participation, guys. You're showing me and yourself, you know what you're talking about. What are the pyrimidines in RNA, Riley? RNA does not have thymine. Okay. Uracil. In RNA, uracil replaces thymine. So a, mo a more than simple question on the AP exam, I doubt this would be on the AP exam because it's so easy. You have a DNA sample that says T-A-A-T-C-G-A-A-T-A-C-G-A-A-A-T. Is this DNA or RNA? Why is it DNA? There's T's. RNA doesn't have T's. It has U's. Now, according to Chargaff's rule, keep in mind, A is bonded to U and G is bonded to C. <coughs> That's how it should be. Okay. Now, the last part for today, there are three types of RNA that you need to know for this class. Now, I wanna be sure you all understand that there are more than three types of RNA in nature. But for our purposes in this class, you need to know three. So the three types of RNA that you need to know. Ryan mentioned this one earlier, mRNA, AKA messenger RNA. I like to think of this as the uh, cooking instructions. If you're gonna build a protein, you need to know how to do it. mRNA tells you how to do it. Messenger RNA takes a sequence from DNA. Where in the cell can you find the DNA? <laughs> so it takes the sequence from uh, actually, replace the word takes with copies. It copies the sequence from DNA, which is the nucleus, and takes it to a ribosome. When I say ribosome, you say, let's try it again. When I say ribosome, you say 
protein. That's where proteins are synthesized. And ribosomes are found in the cytoplasm. So if you were to, eventually sometime in your life, everybody, you're going to be responsible for making Thanksgiving dinner for your own family. Well, if you get all the, the ingredients, that's well and good, but do you know how to make it in the right order? Do you know how to do things in the proper sequence? Messenger RNA tells you how to do it in the right sequence. Now, speaking of ingredients, that gets me to the second one, tRNA, also known as transfer RNA. Transfer RNA provides amino acids. What are amino acids and what do they build? Ayla? Do they build what? They do build protein. So if they build protein, are amino acids monomers or polymers? They're monomers. They provide amino acids to build protein. Guys, tRNA is like the ingredients. You know, quote unquote, pick on Hartley one more time. Let's say I have R, T, L, H, Y, E, A. I get all these letters. That's the ingredients I need to spell her name. Having the ingredients is not enough. You need to know how to do them in the right order. So if I make it, if I do like Y, A, T, R, L, E, H, that's certainly not it. Just because you have the ingredients doesn't mean you can do it in the right order. So the mRNA gives you the recipe, the tRNA gives you the ingredients, and finally, the rRNA gives you the place to do it. The kitchen. This is ribosomal RNA. This is the facility in which you can actually build the protein. It assembles a ribosome. In a ribosome, is the site of protein synthesis. And that's it. Perfect timing. It builds a ribosome.